Hey everyone, again, thanks for joining us here today at Advanced Serverless Orchestration with AWS Step Functions. Again, my name is Chris Munz, and I am a principal and lead developer advocate for serverless here at AWS. I've been at AWS now across a couple roles for a little over seven years, uh, but for the last almost three years, been focusing entirely on this space of serverless. So uh, doing things like this and talking to customers all over the world and helping them understand what serverless is and how they can better use it inside of their own businesses. Now, the topic that we're gonna talk about today is, is an important one. It's around orchestrating the workflows inside of a serverless uh, application. And now, serverless applications have a slightly different kind of look and feel to them at the end of the day if you've been building them. And when it comes to orchestration of components, what we can do is actually really powerful with serverless. I would say that what we're gonna talk about today in terms of breaking down a larger business workflow and to how you can integrate with various components that we have inside of AWS here, what you'll find is that some really powerful uh, architectural patterns can come out. Now, when we talk about serverless, this is a term that across the industry means a lot of things to a lot of people. For us here at AWS, though, we kind of have four key criteria that we use to define what serverless is and what allows us to basically consider a product to be uh, able to be called serverless. So those four criteria are, as you see here, uh, so the first, probably the most simple one, is that there should be no infrastructure that you should need to provision or manage. This means no virtual infrastructure uh, in the sense of uh, virtual machines, no physical machines, or even any container orchestration that you yourself should have to manage, set up, configure, no operating systems to configure, and so forth. The second is automatic scaling. And this is a pretty core concept with uh, cloud computing today. As traffic or requests or events come in, the infrastructure should scale up, and then as they go away, they should scale down. And in this case, you shouldn't have to think a whole lot about turning any knobs for capacity planning or worrying about if you have enough infrastructure to handle that. The third is pay for value. And in this case, when we talk about pay for value. We talk about not, again, having a lot of resources sitting around that aren't being used. So for most AWS services that fall into the serverless family, when you're not using them, you're probably not paying for them. Maybe the lone exception would be places where you have to pay for things like storage or data stored in a database. And so what this means is that you can see really drastic savings compared to infrastructure that would be running 24-7, uh, even infrastructure that might be kind of following the, the peaks and troughs of traffic. In the case of a lot of the serverless products, they respond directly to the events and requests that come in. And so when you're not getting those events or requests, you're not paying for them. And then lastly, being highly available and secure. And we consider security to be our top priority for us here at AWS. We also uh, help our customers build highly available and resilient applications. And so we have a lot of those, uh, both of those kind of capabilities and aspects built into the serverless family of products that we have here today. Now, at the core of the serverless world for us is a product called AWS Lambda. And we're just about coming up actually on the fifth anniversary of us first announcing AWS Lambda back in November of 2014. And when we talk about Lambda, we talk about it sitting in the center of what we consider to be a serverless application. Now, with a serverless application with Lambda, there's basically three core components to it. There is that serverless function, so the Lambda function that you have, which is going to be uh, written in one of some number of languages. And today we have six languages that we support and manage on the AWS side. We also have a capability called the Runtime API, which allows you to bring almost any language that you could think of to uh, Lambda. We have customers running Erlang, Swift, C++, PHP, all sorts of things inside of that. And so that function, again, is code that you write, that you control, that contains your business logic. Now, how that, that code gets executed is via an event source trigger being configured for your function. Today, there are well over 100 different services at AWS that can invoke a Lambda function, uh, either directly or via one of the services that we'll talk about here today. And so what this means is that there's a lot of different patterns for invoking Lambda uh, in response to things like changes in your databases into data state, requests to endpoints like Amazon API Gateway, or even things like Amazon Alexa. Uh, and changes in resource state. So for example, in response to development or management tools, in response to alarms from say something like AWS CloudWatch uh, or other systems that can kick off, uh, again, event-based uh, monitoring inside of your infrastructure. And then what your function does is clean up to you. So does it talk to databases or data stores or other service APIs that maybe are AWS's or exist in your own infrastructure? That business logic is, is entirely yours and aligns with your business need. Now, this is kind of the core of, of a basic example of when we talk about a serverless application. But typically speaking, uh, there are, again, a, a lot of different things that you could do with this. 
So you could build web applications, uh, such as those that are powering static sites or more dynamic websites, uh, again, via typically APIs or API Gateway. You can build backends, so building uh, things like the backends that power mobile applications or IoT-powered devices or even internal microservices. Data processing, so whether this be real-time, uh, MapReduce, stream processing, batch processing, uh, data processing ends up being one of the largest use cases for Lambda that we see out there with customers today. There's things like chatbots, so being able to create a chatbot that interfaces uh, either externally with your customers for sales or support reasons, or even internally in your businesses to help do things like manage facilities, to set up meetings, all sorts of things like that. Amazon Alexa, so for those of you that have a Amazon Alexa capable device at home or at your office, uh, Alexa is showing up in more and more places these days. And with Alexa, you can create what are called skills that can be powered by Lambda. And the Alexa team actually says that Lambda is the best platform for building and scaling skills uh, in alignment with Alexa. And so with this, you can power and enable all sorts of custom workflows, uh, again, through Alexa capable devices. And then lastly, IT automation. And this is typically where a lot of people kind of dip their toes into the serverless space. So again, things like responding to incidents or events inside of your infrastructure, uh, whether it be security events or scaling events or responding to failures or things like that. Uh, there's a lot of things that are possible with Lambda. Now, one thing though that becomes very apparent really quickly when you're building serverless applications is that those applications can get pretty complex. Uh, very rarely do you just have kind of a straightforward sequential action that you need to take from start to end where one function can talk to another and then that one talks to another uh, without there being some level of complexity. And so pretty quickly you start to find that there are things like multiple decision paths that you might have to go through. Uh, you might have to have a multi-step process where maybe things have to happen in parallel or you need to have them both complete before a third action can happen. Uh, you also probably want to respond to failure. So how do you deal with things uh, like protecting downstream resources, responding to timeouts or issues. And so there's a lot of places where you could end up building a lot of this logic and a lot of this orchestration into code. But generally speaking, we want to give you the ability to not have that in your application code and instead extract it out to a higher level uh, in something that is ideally managed for you. And so again, some examples of this. Uh, so again, you've got code and you want to retry something. Uh, so typically, if you're making, say, an HTTP request to another service somewhere, uh, maybe you need to retry, maybe you need to do exponential back off. How much of that do you do? How do you handle that? That could all be complicated code that you might have to write. Uh, sequential tasks. So you need some sort of business logic to be executed first, and then second, and then so on. And again, things that you might need to do. Uh, handling failures, uh, making decisions based on the output of certain tasks, and again, things like parallelization. There's a whole lot of kind of really core concepts in business workflow logic that you might be tempted to write and own the code for. And so in these workflows, there could be a lot of complex things that you want to do. You could have tasks or calls to services that you want to retry. For example, a web API where maybe you need to do an exponential back off and a certain number of retries before you should have some sort of failure logic. Maybe you want to have sequential tasks. So capability A calls capability B, maybe that then calls capability C. Or maybe you need to do some sort of uh, decision-based flow work after that. So based on the output of B, do you go to C or do you go to D? You probably want to have some ability to handle failures intelligently. So if something fails, do you respond with just a failure or do you try another path or is there some sort of other action that maybe you want to take? And then again, as I mentioned earlier, you might have parallel tasks that you want to take on uh, such that two steps have to complete before a third can go and uh, do its thing. Now, you might be tempted to write all this logic into your Lambda function, but what you end up having in is basically more code around the workflow logic and handling of all of these various decisions than you do your actual business logic. And then there are other concerns that you might have, right? So concerns around scale, maintaining state. So for example, if you were able or tried to do this inside of a Lambda function, you'd have to maintain the state of that workflow somewhere, uh, dealing with errors and timeouts. So if you have downstream errors and timeouts, how do you handle that upstream without potentially that own Lambda function timing out? And so again, you run into various things that you'd like to do to make this easier. And these were concerns that we heard from our customers after we first launched Lambda. And that led us then to December of 2016, announcing a service called AWS Step Functions. So just shy of uh, three years ago, we first announced Step Functions. We're gonna spend most of the rest of this session here today talking about Step Functions. Now you see here a diagram of a, a workflow. 
uh, where basically we've got a whole bunch of the capabilities that we uh, kind of discussed previously. Uh, we're going to go through, again, each of these here in today's talk. Now, again, step functions exist really to help you with a number of things, but there's kind of three that come uh, really core to me. So one is, A, as you'll see here, there's a visual aspect to step functions that allows you to have a, a visual workflow that aligns then with the business logic that you're looking to execute. So we have some customers that have massively complex workflows. I'm talking about 80, 90, even maybe more decision trees, failure paths, and so forth inside of their step functions. And they could do this again without having to write the code inside of their own uh, Lambda functions or their own application code, which lends itself to the second uh, aspect of this or the second key benefit. Again, being able to write less code can be really powerful because it means then you can focus more on the code that matters to you and less on some of this stuff, which is fairly boilerplate. And then finally, Step Functions is, at the end of the day, a state engine, which means that it's tracking the state of what's happening inside of your application. Now, you don't have to deal with any low-level primitives of writing or reading to a database as part of this, uh, or dealing with any sort of transactional aspects to that. It's all managed by Step Functions for you. And so this becomes a really powerful way for you, again, to transition between these various aspects of the workflow that you have without having to manage all of that state directly yourself. And so the way that it works is that you can define your workflow in JSON. You can see then visualizations of that flow in the AWS console if you so desired. And you can also monitor the executions of it inside of the console. Now at scale and in day to day, you're probably not going to have this open, uh, but it could be a really useful way for you to troubleshoot what's going on inside of your application and your workflow. So let's take an example. Let's say that I want to uh, process a picture. And what I want to do is I want to shrink it down, so make a thumbnail of it. I want to identify some capabilities, or, or I should say some of the content inside of that photo. So uh, what is inside of it? Do I maybe want to use that metadata for some sort of search capability? And then again, I want to store that information. Now, could I do this inside of a single Lambda function? Potentially. But if I were to think about the various aspects about this, it's really separate bits of logic and separate bits of workflow that with step functions, I can easily break out and again, make more resilient, write less of the, the handling of the logic around this uh, and be able to really, really streamline my application code. So this is an example of a, uh, a step functions workflow that could support this idea. So I'm gonna start off by getting my image. I'm going to extract some image metadata. So is this an image that I support? So I can do a type check on it. Uh, if it is, then I can store the image metadata. And then as you see here on the left-hand side of this slide, maybe I'm gonna use recognition to pull out information about it. I'm also gonna use a Lambda function to turn it into a thumbnail. And then I'm gonna store that information and then the process ends. Now, for some reason, this was a not supported image. Maybe I only take JPEGs and you uploaded a TIFF file or something like that. Uh, then the not supported image type uh, action could be executed and that could respond back with an error message or notify you somehow or just fail out the process. And now in terms of capabilities of uh, step functions, uh, these various blocks here could represent a bunch of different things. So I can have uh, AWS Lambda functions be executed as part of step functions. I could talk to DynamoDB as part of step functions. I could have SNS say that there was a failure in what was being sent. And so there's a whole lot of things as we get into it here that you'll be able to do with step functions that again, allow you to reduce the code that you're writing, have really powerful workflows, uh, and, and again, to have this scale and be really simple for you. So uh, at the core of step functions is a, uh, a state logic uh, DSL that we've written that is in JSON today. And so you can see kind of a very brief example of this uh, this DSL that we have here in JSON uh, that is used for defining the workflow and states. And so we see a bunch of information here about tasks and things like input paths and result paths and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and we'll go again here deeper into this here in a moment. But the idea here is to understand is that you can use JSON to really easily define this. So it's not really any sort of overly complicated language. There's just a couple of really core kind of types uh, that are part of this. And so it's a, a pretty straightforward uh, language to work with. And when we talk about the overall actions that are happening, what you have is the concept of a task state. And again, Step Functions manages that state for you and helps coordinate the actions in between the various tasks. So there's a concept of input and output. As you can see it kind of the top and the bottom of this diagram. So the input information goes into an input path, which is then broken up into parameters. 
uh, that state is then made available to the task or the, you know, the, the service or the code that I'm invoking. Uh, out the other side of that comes a result path, which goes into the output path, which is then processed into output. And so putting this all together, basically what it means is that there's a pretty straightforward flow and logic to how data comes in and then data comes out. Uh, and with that data can be information specific to the workflow. Uh, and then on the outside, the result side, similarly, there could be information uh, about the results, which can then be used process uh, into the next step that you're going to workflow and that you're going to use inside of your workflow. Now, uh, J, uh, step functions DSL supports a concept of JSON path. So what it means is that I have the ability to look into the JSON on the input and the output uh, and go through the basically the tree that we see here. So if I wanted to, in the input path, find out or check for the author of a book, we see here that I can actually search for uh, that by calling um, or, or represented inside of the JSON by looking at the store structure and then the book structure and then the author structure for the first object inside the array that's been passed in. And so again, this makes it really straightforward to be able to process, um, as we'll see here soon, uh, multiple items inside of uh, the input path that's being set in. Uh, and again, allows us to also be able to look for just certain aspects of that data that have been passed in. Now, I mentioned this earlier, the console actually provides a, a really rich interface to understanding the uh, execution details around your step functions executions. So we see here an example of a, a workflow that has completed its execution. We can really truly see that it has succeeded. We can understand uh, a bit more about the, the steps that it went through, the actions for those. You can dive into things like CloudWatch logs for Lambda functions, for some of the other capabilities. We could track the timing of it. Uh, and so this is one of the tools that you have to be able to diagnose and understand failures uh, and potential issues and the performance of your step functions workflows. And we'll talk a little bit more here in a bit about even some further capabilities that you have. So I mentioned again that there's a, a number of capabilities inside of step functions. And again, all of this can be defined uh, by the JSON uh, DSL for the Amazon uh, state machine language that we have here. So this is an example of being able to handle uh, retries of failures. So what we see here is actually, this is pretty robust. This gives us the ability to do exponential back off and retries. It allows us to define the maximum number of attempts that we'd wanna do before we consider this to be a failed action. And so this allows us to basically be a, a good citizen when making requests. A lot of services will tell you, uh, you know, to come back and try again later. We don't wanna necessarily hammer that service over and over again. So we can exponentially back off, handle a certain number of retries. And then again, if that doesn't work, uh, understand that you know maybe there's something bigger here and then have a failure path. We also have the ability in step functions to capture failures uh, or exceptions and handle them in certain ways. And this also supports the ability for you to handle custom failure messages from services like Lambda. So if you had inside of your Lambda function code, uh, certain ways of handling and processing failures. Step functions then has the ability to handle specific actions or tasks after that based on what the error message is. And so this can be really powerful for again, having very you know, complex and dynamic uh, failure handling inside of your workflows based on what's happening inside of your Lambda functions. It doesn't just have to be kind of a, a generic failure code that you sent back. Uh, you can be very specific and then again, have very specific next tasks that can be activated. Now, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, we saw this in a, one of the previous slides, that step functions can talk to a lot more than just Lambda. Uh, we have a number of integrations now for AWS step functions uh, with first a number of different compute services, so you can do things like kick off tasks in Amazon ECS or AWS Fargate. You also have the ability to kick off AWS batch uh, executions. And so right there, that's a whole bunch of different compute services that give you quite a lot of flexibility in your workflows. You also have the ability to talk to services like Amazon SQS, Simple Queue Service, Amazon SNS, Simple Notification Service. And this can be really powerful for integrating with other um, microservices or services that you have in your infrastructure that maybe can't directly integrate with Step Functions today. So you can very easily put objects into a queue where you need to buffer the amount of uh, information going in to a service that's behind it. You can use Amazon SNS to directly send messages to an HTTPS or HTTP endpoint. And so both of these, again, become really powerful in uh, distributed systems. You can also put data directly into uh, DynamoDB. 
And so DynamoDB is a non-relational database here at AWS uh, that can scale dynamically with workloads as well. And then we've got two other services here, uh, Amazon SageMaker, which is a machine learning service. So you can use Step Functions to integrate around doing machine learning tasks, uh, which is also really powerful. And then finally, AWS Glue, uh, which supports things like ETL workflows. So you can use Step Functions as a key part of, for example, a data lake. Uh, or doing data analytics or business analytics inside of uh, your infrastructure and against everything from customer data to infrastructure information. Uh, there's a lot of things that you could do uh, with services like Loop. And again, the end goal here is to reduce the amount of code that you might be writing. And so we see here an example of uh, trying to manage a batch workflow. Um, and so previously, before we had these integration capabilities, you see kind of on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, what you might have to do to support this. So you might have a workflow where you submitted a job, and then you're going to have a you know, sleep function that basically takes some time to wait for uh, a number of seconds before it kicks off another step. Uh, that step could then go and look and see if the job is completed, and if not, go back and wait some more time. If it is completed, did it succeed or did it fail? And then based on the outcome of that, then have a function to send a, a message to SNS. So you've got here basically, uh, at a minimum, uh, a need to go through six different Lambda functions, potentially, or six different tasks to uh, complete this workflow. Whereas we see on the right-hand side of the screen with this direct service integration, it's just a lot easier. So we can now tell Step Functions to directly kick off a, a batch compute workflow, and then based on the outcome of that, directly publish a message to SNS. And so in this situation, you're actually running, writing no custom code, you're just writing the uh, state function DSLJSON. Uh, and again, you can integrate with compute well beyond just Lambda. So for example, you can kick off a Fargate, ser uh, a Fargate task uh, Fargate is a container-based offering um, that, again, works very similar to container-based offerings that you see kind of all across the industry today. So you can see that you can integrate with an AWS Fargate task. Uh, now, Fargate we consider to be a serverless container offering here at AWS and that you don't manage any of the infrastructure or container orchestration today. Uh, and so what this means is that Step Functions can directly integrate with long-running tasks that can execute inside of Fargate or even tasks that need to run on, say, more opinionated compute resources. Um, so really powerful capabilities here. And then after that, tar that Fargate task has completed, then you can take the output of that and uh, take on another action inside of your workflow. An example of the JSON for this, so we see here actually far, uh, Step Functions going and completely launching the Fargate task for us. Uh, we can put it at a cluster, say the task definition, uh, and then go in so far as to configure the network infrastructure around this. So if this Fargate task, say, had to talk to uh, resources inside of a VPC, like a relational database. And so uh, all this is possible here just directly inside of the Fargate task uh, definition. Uh, similarly, we can do things in this workflow like configure the SNS uh, tasks off of this. Uh, and again, pretty straightforward. We have the ability to, based on the success or failure, decide what the messages that we want to publish, uh, take output from the previous task, and then pass that on forward. And so uh, again, really straightforward JSON in order to make this happen. Uh, here again is an example of you at runtime configuring the topic for the uh, for these SNS tasks to exist, and then again here the action that actually gets executed upon. And so again, in both of these situations, or at least in the situation of SNS, you're not necessarily running any code to handle that. Obviously, for the Fargate task, you would have your application running inside of that container. Uh, but again, gluing these pieces together here becomes really straightforward. Now, we've got a number of new capabilities in Step Functions that have been launched here in just the last couple of uh, months. Uh, we're going to walk through each of these. I find each of these to be really, really powerful additional components to Step Functions. So the first is a concept of callbacks. Now, we've had since the early days of uh, Step Functions the ability for you to run human tasks. Uh, and now those human tasks could be uh, basically achieved by um, you know, having a human on the other side of an interface who gets a notification and clicks a button and then it tells the task to complete. Um, but the callback pattern now is actually a lot more powerful. Uh, you have the ability to have really long running uh, step functions where, uh, you know, a process goes away and does a thing and then you can come back and have it finalize that process yourself. 
And so um, based on this now, you don't have to have the, the kind of um, uh, step functions workflow hanging around. Uh, this could be an asynchronous task that happens. And so uh, previously where it would have blocked, this again gives you quite a lot more flexibility. So this could be useful for, again, long running tasks that need to run outside of your traditional workflow. It could be really useful for, um, for human-based tasks. And so again, just adds a, another level of dynamicness uh, and resiliency to your workflows. Another thing that we launched shortly after this was the ability for you to have nested or child workflows. Now, the idea here is one of the things that we find is that as organizations start using step functions, they start to come up with a lot of repeatable patterns inside those step functions. You might have some sort of core business logic uh, of a workflow that continues to exist inside of other aspects of your infrastructure or your application, your architecture. And so basically at the end of the day, what nested child workflows allow you to do is create a reusable workflow that can then be invoked from other workflows. Uh, and so again, this in itself is incredibly powerful because you can take then uh, you know, a bunch of simplified workflows uh, and combine them into something much larger uh, and then again, reuse those workflows again. Now this supports both a synchronous and an asynchronous model. So you can block the parent workflow. Um, you could also uh, have, again, like I said here, an asynchronous model that is, uh, supports the callback model for calling back to the parent later on and saying that work is done. Uh, and so there's different reasons for using both of those. Uh, depending on your use case. Uh, but again, now this is a, a really easy way to um, simplify that. It also supports the capability of having a heartbeat. And so where you might have a task that has a certain timeout set for it, the child task can now heartbeat back to the parent workflow saying, hey, I'm still doing this work. This hasn't completed yet. Uh, and this even allows you to have the ability to be the callback model to have the child task be asynchronous off the parent, which is asynchronous, and have it report back that it's completed a certain amount of work and then still continue to do other work that the parent maybe doesn't have to know anything about or be responsible for. So again, just gives you even more flexibility in the workflows. And then most recently here, just a couple of weeks ago, we added a new capability towards the parallelization aspects of what's supported inside of step functions. Now previously you could define a set number of parallelized tasks inside of a workflow. So we see here an example where I just have two tasks that I want to execute at the same time. I want to look up an address, I want to look up a phone number, and I want to pass that on then to the end result of this function. But what we just announced is dynamic parallelism. And so uh, via something called the map state, uh, as the name may sound here, this allows you to take a dynamic number of inputs and then automatically execute a, a certain task or even potentially a uh, nested uh, child workflow inside of your workflow for each of those items. And so this also allows you to have the ability to set a maximum concurrency so you can prevent, say, any sort of, uh, you know, resource starvation inside of these workflows for whatever you might be talking to. So really powerful thing. We find that there are a lot of times that customers inside of workflows, especially in things like ETL workflows, or data processing workflows, may have an unbounded number of items that come in. Uh, and whereas the previous parallel state would have had a fixed number, you might have had to do some sort of uh, looping inside the workflow to handle that yourself, uh, the map state just makes this much, much easier. So again, really powerful and uh, pretty straightforward to set up via the JSON. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is actually not a capability in step functions, but actually an entirely new service that we announced over this past summer. Uh, that exists inside of the same uh, service orchestration family that we have step functions in. And this is Amazon Event Bridge. Now, Amazon Event Bridge is different in a number of ways compared to step functions. Whereas step functions is used to manage basically a, a predefined, discrete kind of workflow between a number of capabilities inside of your application, Event Bridge exists to allow you to share events between uh, potentially many different parts of your application in a way that's not directly orchestrated. And so, uh, with this now, it has the ability to uh, take in a number of events from AWS services and then pass those on after being processed by rules to a number of different targets. Now, this is built on top of the, uh, the scalability of CloudWatch events, which is the service that we've had here now at AWS for a while. And so this is really meant for massive scale. It's meant to enable kind of uh, heavily distributed microservices-based architectures. And it's got a really simple programming model towards it. You just simply put events in, you have rules that are defined then that pass those events onto targets. 
And so what we can do with EventBridge is say, take an event that comes in from a single service and then pass that on to a number of other services in parallel, kind of in a, a forked pattern, if you will. So we see that we could have EventBridge talk to SNS to send a message to an HTTPS server that's maybe running inside of our on-premises infrastructure. We could pass a message to EventBridge, or I'm sorry, from EventBridge to uh, Kinesis Data Firehose, which can then put that into S3 and make it available for say, business intelligence. We can have a message sent from EventBridge and passed into Kinesis Firehose, then go into S3 and make it available for services like Amazon Athena to do BI analysis on top of it. We can pass some data to ECS, and we can pass the data to Lambda again to talk to other services. And then we could also use EventBridge to pass information into step functions. Now, given that EventBridge has integration with many, many services across the AWS, what this means again now is that you have a really easy way to have those services kick off step functions workflows. And so it unlocks the ability for all sorts of events inside of the AWS ecosystem to now directly kick off workflows for you. There's another thing that step functions can do uh, with EventBridge, which is that step functions already has the ability for you to report on lifecycle events inside of your step functions workflow. And so those can then be passed into EventBridge themselves passed into rules and then sent to other places. So for example, if you have uh, tasks that fail or timeout, uh, you could take that information, pass it through a rule, and then maybe execute a Lambda function to send a notification or to replay some information or to test things. And so again, what you get on both sides of the equation is that you can capture information about, work so about life cycle events with EventBridge, pass them to other AWS targets, but then you can also use EventBridge to execute step functions directly yourself. Um, so this is really useful, again, for auditing, for observability, for tracking individual workflows, for responding to failure, for gluing together all sorts of different AWS components into your, your orchestration. Uh, and so again, the two of these work hand in hand really well together. So talk a little bit about some of the tooling that's available to you in building out your workflows and testing them. Now, one tool that I would encourage you to, to go and grab today if you've never used it before is a tool called Statement. And you can find this on GitHub in the AWS Labs organization under Statement. Now, this is a tool that's been open sourced by the Step Functions team. And what it allows you to do is to do linting on top of the state function uh, DS, uh, JSON DSL that you use for defining your workflows. And so this should really be a, a key step in the overall development and deployment of your workflows. Uh, it's going to save you for the, those you know, weird little typos or that times when maybe your JSON isn't valid. And so I would definitely encourage you to get this tool and, you know, again, include it inside of the workflows, uh, inside of your development workflows for managing your step functions workflows. The second is that, you know, some of the serverless products that we have lend themselves uh, you know, incredibly well to being able to scale up and scale down. Uh, they're completely managed for you. But there are a lot of developers that still want to have the uh, capability to develop their applications locally. And so one of the tools that we have that can help you with this is a Step Functions local tool. And so we see here actually a screenshot from Docker Hub. Um, the local tool is made available to you either as a jar that you can install locally or as a Docker container that you can run directly inside of your workstation, your dev environment, wherever it is that you might be building application code. And so uh, this has a number of capabilities built into it as well. It has the ability for you to integrate with uh, Lambda functions running locally via AWS SAM, which we'll talk about here in a moment. It also has the ability for you to integrate from the local environment up with services that are running directly in AWS. So you can talk to the AWS services from inside of your step functions here. Uh, you can talk to different regions, different endpoints, uh, and all of that's very straightforward and easy to configure inside of the configuration file for step functions local. We see here just an example of then using the AWS CLI to invoke the local endpoint of step functions local to execute a, a command or basically to kick off a workflow. And so this is really powerful and will help you get started. Next, I'll talk a little bit here about AWS SAM. So SAM is the mascot that we have here for serverless. And uh, this is our a little squirrel friend that you see here in this slide. But SAM actually stands for or a lot more than that. So SAM is short for serverless application model. Uh, serverless application model or SAM is a uh, extension built on top of CloudFormation to really simplify the building and deploying of serverless applications. 
And so there are a number of capabilities unique to SAM that basically, again, will, would take you from having to write many dozens of lines of uh, JSON or YAML and instead write just a handful or maybe tens of lines of JSON and YAML. Now, because it's an extension on top of CloudFormation, it supports the ability for you to use pretty much any CloudFormation resource inside of the template for it. And you still use the CloudFormation service to execute these templates to launch the resource stacks that are created by it. And you get all of the underlying capabilities that exist inside of CloudFormation as part of that. Now, this is an open source specification, uh, and you can find out a lot more information at aws.amazon.com slash serverless slash SAM. Partnered up with the SAM template engine capability is a CLI tool called AWS SAM CLI. Now, the CLI tool gives you a whole bunch of capabilities local inside of, again, your laptop, your workstation, whatever it is that you develop code. First, it can allow you to create new serverless applications. Now, again, this is going to be based around just Lambda in this case. So it'll create for you a SAM template. It'll give you some example code. Uh, it'll give you a test event that you could pass in. Uh, then it gives you the ability to mock the Lambda service via two different ways. One is via a mock API gateway proxy style interface. So this was where you would just basically throw a curl command at a local interface and test out your API. The second is via mocking the Lambda service API. Now the Lambda service API at the end of the day is the thing that basically gives you the ability to talk to Lambda. And so with this, you can pass in pretty much any uh, event structure that you want, including the event structures that come from step functions. And so uh, with this, the step functions local interface, you have the ability to directly interface with uh, Lambda functions that are running locally in your own dev environment via SAM CLI. And this runs inside of a Docker container locally as well. So you do have to have Docker in your environment for this to work. And so again, what you end up with is basically two Docker uh, images that are running as active containers that are communicating with each other. And it's pretty straightforward and simple to get up and running. So again, how you can combine the two of these is that you can, uh, in terms of deploying, is first you can have both local tools running, again, wherever it is that you develop code, uh, be able to update your step functions workflow and then uh, update your Lambda code and push them all at the same time. Then when it comes to actually deploying these out into your production environment or up into the cloud, as it were, you can just use the AWS step functions, cloud formation resources of state machine and activity. And yes, I realized that I missed an E on this, but that's okay. Um, and then you could use the, in SAM, the AWS serverless function resources to configure your Lambda functions uh, and all of the various capabilities around that. Now, given that you're creating all these resources inside of a template file, and it's either gonna be uh, JSON or YAML in this case, uh, you can track all this inside of a CI CD pipeline, uh, which means that you have the ability to do version control uh, of that file to track it inside of a code repository to test across multiple environments and kind of follow all of the good best practices that you would around CI and CD. Now, one thing that we will say that is, is kind of a caveat to pay attention to today is that versioning of state machines is tricky. Uh, earlier this year, we gave you the capability to do uh, updates directly on uh, existing step functions, whereas previously that was something that you couldn't do. So you can update existing step functions. It will only apply to new executions that come in uh, it won't impact anything that's in flow. But when it comes to actually versioning state functions, this is something today where you would either have to create a brand new state function and give it, say, a different name, uh, throw in some sort of you know, semver type of structure to it if that was your thing. Um, but there isn't any concept of versioning today in step functions like there is in Lambda. Again, this is something that we're aware of, and uh, I hope that in the near future we can give you some guidance on how you can do this better. Awesome. So closing today, we went through kind of a whole bunch of concepts around step functions. Again, really step functions exist to allow you to remove the orchestration work that you would typically be writing a whole lot of code for and pass it up to a service that's going to manage that for you uh, a lot easier. It's going to reduce the amount of code that you have. It's going to simplify that state management and tracking. And then it comes with a whole bunch of capabilities. So obviously the ability to do decisions between tasks, to handle retries, things like exponential back off, to do uh, you know, complicated and custom failure handling, and then to do things like parallel tasks. Recently here, just in the last couple of months, we've given you the ability to do callbacks, so the ability for you to have a separate process or 
uh, even a manual action callback in an async way back to your uh, workflow. Uh, nested child stacks, which basically gives you the ability to have a workflow call another workflow, which again allows for reusability and simplification of your workflows. And then more, again, most recently here, map or dynamic parallel tasks, which allow you to give kind of an unbounded number of inputs in and have either an individual task or even a nested child's uh, task be kicked off as part of that. Now, Step Functions is more than just Lambda, right? You can integrate with Fargate, with ECS, SNS, SQS, DynamoDB, EventBridge, Batch, Glue, all sorts of things that you have the ability to do uh, a number of capabilities with. Again, EventBridge can be a really powerful kind of sibling product alongside of Step Functions to do things like capture information about what's happening with your workflows, pass that on to other services like Lambda or Kinesis or Fargate or put data uh, out to, again, a number of different services. And lastly, when it comes to development and testing, Step Functions Local plus SAM CLI gives the ability to do a whole lot of this local inside of your own development environment. Uh, they're both pretty simple tools to work with as they can come both bundled up inside of Docker images. And so getting started with them is as easy as downloading them, uh, doing a little bit of configuration and then firing them up. So hopefully you found this all to be uh, useful for you here today. Um, you could read into this a lot further though by going to aws.amazon.com slash serverless and exploring kind of the full uh, portfolio of serverless products that we have here at AWS. I mentioned a little bit about AWS SAM and how it could be really useful for helping to streamline building serverless applications. Uh, you can find out a little bit more about SAM by going to aws.amazon.com slash serverless slash SAM. Again, my name is Chris Munns. You can find me at munns at amazon.com or at Chris Munns on Twitter. I want to thank you again for joining us here today in this tech talk. I uh, hope that we see you soon. Uh, feel free to reach out if there's ever anything that I can help you out with in the serverless space here at AWS. Uh, I'm happy to help. But thanks again for joining us. Uh, thanks again for all of your questions. We're going to continue to try to push through and answer a couple more questions for you here. I want to thank my Q&A team again and uh, thank the hosts for uh, helping us make today work so smoothly. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day.